Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to AP U.S. History. As today we look at the development of totalitarian governments in Europe in the 1920s and 30s. Now, Woodrow Wilson had said that the Great War was a war to end all wars. But in some ways, it was actually a cause of the Second World War. As the Treaty of Versailles left Germany poor, humiliated, and bitter. And uh, the Great War devastated much of the rest of Europe, too. Um, and, um, and in uh, Russia, um, now known as the Soviet Union, um, had replaced its ancient monarchy with a communist dictatorship and lost much of its western territory to Germany, who in turn lost it to Poland and the new Baltic republics. Even some countries that were on the winning side um, were in a bad position. Italy, in particular, felt they had not benefited from the war. And in this chaotic and bitter time, many countries turned to strong leaders who could offer simple answers and promises of a return to glory, and often someone else to blame for their problems. And as these leaders began to exert total control over their countries, um, what develops we call totalitarianism not just wanting um, the people they ruled to follow their laws, but wanting control even over how they felt and what they thought, um, in total control over every aspect of society. In the Soviet Union, the first communist leader, Vladimir Lenin, died in 1924 and was replaced by Joseph Stalin, who remained in power until 1953. And he was deeply paranoid. There certainly were some communists who disapproved of him, but he believed everyone was out to overthrow him. And he enforced his rule by terrorizing, imprisoning, starving, or killing his enemies, um, or people he thought might be his enemies, even if they weren't necessarily so. Um, in the 1930s in particular, um, he ordered a series of purges um, to clean out potential enemies, again, particularly many high-ranking officers of the Soviet army, which would lead them with, without many experienced leaders when World War I broke out. But millions of people were killed um, by execution, by starvation, either from bad policies, or in some cases, such as Ukraine, the deliberate starvation of some regions of the country shipping out the grain they grew there to use elsewhere and leaving millions of Ukrainians to starve. Um, even when the government tried to run farms, the collective farms, where farmers had their land taken from them and then were forced to work on it under government control, were often very ineffective or inefficient, um, and people starved by the millions. Um, it's estimated at least 20 million people died in the Soviet Union. Um, due to Stalin's policies during the 29 years he was in charge. On the other hand, he was able to forcibly industrialize the Soviet Union, putting lots of resources, including essentially slave labor, into building factories and mines and railroads and other infrastructure. Um, coordinating this through a series of five-year plans, with the government managing the entire economy, and according to plans designed five years at a time. Um, so economically the country became in some ways quite modern, um, but um, under a very harsh and murderous dictatorship. In Italy, the government was very weak and the economy very poor. Although Italy was on the winning side of the First World War, they didn't get much land from it. They'd hoped to get colonies overseas and got none. They had hoped to gain land from Austria-Hungary and gained very little, primarily a small region in the Alps known as South Tyrol. Although, as you can see from uh, the flat, the sign there under the Austrian, under the Italian flag, that sign is painted in the colors of the Austrian flag. So South Tyrol is not Italian in German, the language of uh, the Austrian Empire. So. And um, many Italians were unsatisfied with their leaders during the First World War and with a bad economy in the 1920s. In particular, many veterans could not find work after the war, and they and others formed groups to try to take care of themselves. 
Some um, became communists. The Red Scare was not completely baseless. There were communist movements in Europe and the United States. Um, but while some turned to left-wing ideas like communism, others turned to the extreme right-wing, joining, for example, the National Fascist Party of Italy, taking its name, by the way, from the Faces, um, a symbol of the Roman Republic, a group of rods bound together with straps and with an axe tied to the side. In the Roman Republic and later republics, um, this represented the unity of the people bound together in that bundle of rods and the power of the government, even the power of life and death in the axe. Indeed, this symbol was once popular in the United States as we looked back to the Roman Republic for an inspiration. It can be found carved inside the U.S. Capitol building. It was on the back of the U.S. dime for many years in the early and mid 20th century up through 1945. Today we don't much use the faces in it being associated with the fascists under the leadership of Benito Mussolini. And fascism, um, as led by Mussolini, was an extreme nationalist philosophy. He promised to restore the glory of the Roman Empire, partly um, through a militarist philosophy too, promising to build up Italy's military. Um, although one way he made Italy's military seem so powerful was by having units smaller than other countries' units. What might have a thousand men in some armies only had 800 in his, so he could have 20% more of them on paper. Um, and like many groups, um, he created his own group um, of armed followers, known as the Black Shirts, and many of them unemployed World War I veterans, who in 1922 organized a march on Rome, marching down the roads of Italy to the capital where um, they overthrew um, the Prime Minister of Italy and um, forced the King of Italy to name Mussolini the Prime Minister. Um, and in this, he had the support of many businessmen, much of the upper class, who were worried um, about the strikes and riots, um, often led by the communists. Although there wasn't a good strike started by the communists, or a good riot, sometimes the black shirts would start their own riot secretly and then stop it, proving they could restore order. Once in power, though, Mussolini began creating a totalitarian government under his leadership. Indeed, while he was officially prime minister, he normally used the title Il Duce, simply meaning the leader. And for a totalitarian leader, what other title do you need but the leader? He tried to manage every part of Italian life. One of his famous claims was he made the trains run on time. Although one way he did that um, was telling the station masters that if a train showed up late, they should just change the box so it appeared to have shown up on time. He outlawed other political parties, stopped freedom of speech and freedom of the press, um, and strikes by the working class. And to restore the Roman Empire, and to show off the military he was building up, he also tried to avenge one of the great African defeats um, in the colonial period. Because by the time Mussolini rose to power in the 1920s, Italy did have a few colonies in Africa. <coughs> Libya, Eritrea, um, and Italian Somaliland, which today is the bad part of Somalia. Um, but he wanted more. But there wasn't much left. Other European countries ruled pretty much all of Africa, with one exception. Anybody know what major uh, African country was still independent by, say, 1935? Independent and led by native black Africans. Liberia. Well, Liberia actually is independent too, although arguably a colony of the United States, as its leaders were former American slaves who settled there in the 1800s. Um, but there was another, um, ruled by, by emperors dating back um, 2,500 years. And who in the 1890s had stopped an Italian invasion, the only time an African country permanently held off European invaders? Not Egypt, but close. The British took them over for not paying their debts. Morocco? Not Morocco. The French had them by now. Although we wish them the best. They're the first country to recognize the United States as an independent country. 
Now, it was conveniently close to some of Italy's other colonies. Ethiopia so, had remained independent, um, but that meant it was free for the taking if the Italians could do it, and would let them get revenge for the Ethiopians holding off King Menelik, or holding off the Italians under King Menelik in 1896. So in October of 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia um, from its neighboring colonies in Eritrea and Italian Somaliland. Um, and um, this shouldn't have happened. All war had ended. Indeed, war had been outlawed. And there is today an organization in 1935 to prevent wars from taking place. And Ethiopia was a member. And what's that organization? League of Nations. The Emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, went to the League of Nations, of which his country was a member, and asked them to stop Italy, to do something. But the League of Nations at the moment completely ignored him. Um, according to legend, at least, though, he warned them, it is us today, it will be you tomorrow. Although at first, things were actually going fairly well for the Ethiopians, surprisingly well. Um, the Italians had, it was believed, one of the most modern militaries in the world. Machine guns, a very advanced air force, um, tanks, and more. Whereas the Ethiopian Air Force was three leftover biplanes from World War I. They had machine guns the British had given them in 1896. Some were still using stone-tipped spears. And yet, they were winning. And so, the uh, Italians finally had to cheat and used poison gas in one of the few times it's been used since the First World War. And that was too much for the Ethiopians. Um, so even with the help of St. George, as pictured um, in this Ethiopian illustration, uh, Ethiopia was forced to surrender in 1936, in May. Um, and Haile Selassie went into exile. Finally, once it was too late to do any good, the League of Nations did criticize Italy for what it had done, Italy responded by withdrawing from the League of Nations and turning more and more towards other fascist countries in Europe, um, including Spain. Now, during the 1800s, Spain had um, more than one civil war um, had become very unstable and very polarized. There was little room, it seemed, for moderate politicians or compromises. In principle, Spain was a constitutional monarchy under King Alfonso XIII, but um, by the 1920s, he needed the military to stay in power, essentially turning Spain into a military dictatorship, until 1930, when he and the military rulers were overthrown. Um, and in 1931, he was officially deposed, and Spain became a republic but one led, during most of its brief history, by pretty radical liberal groups, anti-traditionalist, anti-church, the Catholic Church having had a lot of authority in Spain, and some wanted to end that. Indeed, many of them had communist or socialist or anarchist roots, and some were anti-religious entirely. Here we see some Spanish Republicans trying to shoot down a statue of Jesus. Um, of course, this upset many conservative Spanish, um, and so, some members of the middle classes, the upper classes, the aristocracy, the church, and the military um, opposed the Spanish Republic, not all, but many, forming a group known as the Spanish Nationalists, led by Generalissimo Francisco Franco. Um, and furthermore, in the Spanish Civil War that would be fought from 1936 to 1939, people from all over the world came to support both sides. Um, the, uh, the Republic was supported heavily by the Soviet Union, and Soviet agents committed enough atrocities there to turn some people off to communism. But there were volunteers from many places that simply liked the idea of supporting a Republic. One of the international brigades was the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, made up of 2,800 American volunteers. The Nationalists were supported by the Italians and the Germans and by many Irish volunteers who wanted to fight to protect the Catholic Church. 
Francisco Franco himself was once asked if he was a fascist. And trying to be cute, he said, well, what is a fascist? And when he described it for him, he said, well, if that is a fascist, then yes, I am a fascist. And with the help um, of Italy and especially Germany and others, he eventually won the Spanish Civil War in 1939. Now, a couple years later, um, Germany and Italy would ask if he wouldn't like to repay the favor when they got into World War II, to which he said, nah. Um, and whereas Hitler and Mussolini would eventually die of gunshot wounds, Franco would live um, to die of old age 30 years after Hitler and Mussolini. So I guess he made the right call in sitting out World War II. And right-wing governments, many of them totalitarian dictatorships, or at least um, along those lines, were established in many parts of Europe. Romania had their fascist Iron Guard, or green shirts. Hungary, following the uh, collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had officially become a monarchy, but had never chosen a king. So they were ruled by a regent, um, Admiral Horte Miklos. Horte being his family name, that being the custom in Hungary. In English, we often present his name as Nicholas Horthy. And although not quite a fascist, he was pretty close, and eventually, as you can see, allied with Hitler, although partly because the option was either to ally with Hitler or be taken over. Portugal developed a fascist-style government similar to that of Spain. They also sat out World War II, and their dictator would die of old age in the late 1960s. Um, a few years later, his followers were overthrown um, in a peaceful uprising. Austria developed a fascist movement, the Fatherland Front, claiming to be the purest Germans there were, indeed claiming to be better Germans than the Germans. In Greece, under King George II, the military propped up the king essentially as a military dictatorship. In Yugoslavia in the 1930s, King Alexander tried to completely remake his country, which had been made up of combining a number of different, mostly Slavic groups, Serbians, like himself, in charge, but Croatians, Bosnians, Slovenes, um, as well as uh, Macedonians, as well as some non-Slavic people like the Albanians and Kosovars. He wanted to get rid of all those distinctions um, and completely start over. He abolished many traditional place names, for example, um, renaming places after the nearest rivers or other names. This was not real popular, and he was eventually assassinated. Um, and Yugoslavia backed away a bit from these changes under the next king, but it was still far from a democracy. In Poland, the war hero, Josef Pilsudski, who had fought against Russia um, right after Poland's independence, became leader of the country. Um, and again, a, a military dictator, or pretty close. There certainly are shades with all these guys. In Bulgaria, um, there was a communist movement in the 1920s, which was brutally suppressed in what is known as the White Terror. If red is the color of communism, in many places white is the color of monarchy. And this terror was officially done in the name of the Tsar of Bulgaria. Eventually he put an end to it, but only once most of the communists were safely killed. But most important of all would be Germany. Now, right after World War I ended, Germany became a republic, known as the Weimar Republic, its constitution being written in the city of Weimar, a city associated with Germany's cultural past, with art, especially with literature, with science, with the, um, with the writer Goethe in particular, to try to emphasize that side of Germany rather than the militarist tradition of Prussia. But the government under the Weimar Republic was very weak. Um, they had proportional representation, so a political party that even got 1 or 2 percent of the vote might have a few seats in the Reichstag, or Parliament, of Germany. So no party ever had a majority, making it hard to accomplish much. Um, reparations left the economy very weak. Um, in the early 1920s, Germany tried to deal with this in part by printing paper money, more and more paper money, um, leading to inflation and eventually hyperinflation. When World War I had begun, 
one U.S. dollar would have bought three German marks. In early 1924, one U.S. dollar would have bought three trillion German marks. Here we can see a thousand mark note overstamped to make it a million mark note. Here we have a 50 million mark note, and it got bigger and bigger than that. Here we have a man wallpaper in his house with paper money, because that's cheaper than buying wallpaper. Um, workers sometimes asked to be paid twice a day because they wanted to take half their pay and spend it on their lunch break because its value would have fallen even further by the end of the day. There is a legend, possibly true, of a man taking a wheelbarrow of money, because you did sometimes have to give your pay in a wheelbarrow, parking it outside a store, going in to shop for something, when he came back outside, somebody had stolen the wheelbarrow, but dumped the money on the ground because it wasn't worth running off with. Um, you know, people who had saved money their whole lives lost it. Um, eventually, Germany did bring this hyperinflation under control, and to a certain extent, it did help some businesses deal with their debts and get a fresh start, which had been the point. But for many people, it left them with a deep fear of inflation, and deep resentment toward their government. Indeed, many Germans came to feel that their government had betrayed them, not just with this hyperinflation, but all the way back in the Treaty of Versailles. After all, when the war ended, there were no Allied troops on German soil, or very, very few. There were those who felt their own leaders had stabbed them in the back by giving up so much at Versailles. And so, many Germans began turning to radical political movements. Some became communists. Um, others joined the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party. Um, and although Adolf Hitler had originally entered the party as a spy um, on behalf of the army, he soon became not just a full-fledged member, but leader of the Nazi Party, who, um, in the early 1920s, decided to uh, seize power in what is known as the Beer Hall Putsch. Being Germans, they had to start in a beer hall. A putsch is a German word similar to the word coup, an attempt to overthrow the government. Uh, they were trying to seize power in the southern German state of Bavaria um, by force. This putsch was pretty rapidly put down. Many of the Nazi leaders were arrested. But, although most Germans disagreed with the Nazis' methods, quite a few were sympathetic to their goals of creating um, a more conservative, nationalistic government. And so, when Hitler was put on trial, the judge essentially let him use his trial as a chance to express his ideas. Um, he was basically given control of the witness stand to speak as long as he wanted. He got a pretty short prison sentence, later shortened further for good behavior, and was even allowed a private secretary while in prison to help him write a new book, Mein Kampf, meaning My Struggle, which was partly a biography of his life, partly a biography of Germany's problems, and a plan to solve those problems. Problems that he said were caused primarily by communists, by liberal politicians, and above all, by non-German ethnic groups living in Germany, especially that race of parasites, the Jews. And he blamed this on a stab in the back of the German people by their leaders, and the Jews above all. A race of parasites, he said, living in other countries, living off them, not having a country of their own. Hitler promised, um, should he have the opportunity, to restore to, uh, glory to the German people, whom he said were an Aryan race, the original, purest, and highest version of the human race. Germans, of course, were members, but so were Norwegians. Indeed, that's a Norwegian poster there on the side, uh, trying to recruit Norwegian volunteers during World War II. Um, Swedes, Danes, um, maybe the Dutch, maybe the English, um, might all count as Aryan peoples. Um, and he would also put the lesser races in their place. His book became a bestseller, although um, I think people bought it and didn't actually read it, because when Hitler did everything he said he was going to do, people were surprised. 
After a short stay in prison, shortened further due to good behavior, Hitler returned to politics and um, would this time win power through the democratic process as he campaigned um, for the political party um, of the Nazis across Germany, using radio, traveling by car, traveling by plane, the first major politician to give multiple speeches in different parts of the country on the same day thanks to air travel. Um, a campaign called Hitler over Germany. And as Germany's problems grew worse, the Nazis' promises to solve them got more and more Nazis elected to the German Reichstag. And then in 1930, the Great Depression hit Germany. The economy was already precarious. Um, the Dawes plan and the Young plan from the United States had tried to help them out. But as the Depression got worse in America, we could no longer help Germany. Um, and by 1932, Germany was in a deep crisis with six million or more people unemployed. There we see a man saying a healthy young man seeks work. And so they elected even more Nazis to the Reichstag. Um, they never had a complete majority, but they eventually did have the largest number of seats. And Germany, um, like Britain and most countries with a parliament, chooses their prime minister, or as they're known in Germany, the chancellor, through the Reichstag. Whichever party has a majority gets to pick the chancellor. Um, or in Germany's case, they would have to compromise among the major parties. And they finally agreed to make Hitler chancellor, feeling that as the largest single party, the Nazis had earned their chance. And also people who didn't like the Nazis felt that once Hitler had the chance to try out his ideas, he would fail and people would turn away from him. In 1933, Hitler was named Chancellor. Um, and later, when uh, the president of Germany died, the president being a relatively symbolic figure in place of the uh, now gone emperor, um, the offices of Chancellor and President were combined into one and Hitler would just call himself the Führer, or leader, of Germany. And then shortly after um, the Nazis came to power, the Reichstag building burned down. Um, not completely destroyed, but gutted by a fire. And we don't entirely know how this happened. Many historians figure the Nazis set it themselves to create an emergency they could benefit from. They did, though, find a Dutch communist in the ruins who confessed to have setting the fire. So perhaps he really did. Perhaps he was coerced into doing so. Perhaps he was coerced into a false confession. Or perhaps he really did do it. Historians are not quite sure. But whether they created the crisis or just got lucky, the Nazis made the most of it. As the members of the Reichstag soon met and passed the Enabling Act. Um, giving Hitler temporary emergency powers, essentially voting the powers of dictatorship um, to the man who would soon take the title of Führer, or leader. From there, Hitler would never voluntarily relinquish these temporary emergency powers, but he had achieved them step by step through the democratic process, using democracy to destroy democracy. And this would be part of Hitler's success in the years to come. He would be a master of gradualism, doing things one slow, careful step at a time. Had he gone for all his plans right from the first, he would surely have failed. But doing things slowly and gradually and building up to it, um, he very nearly did create the thousand-year empire he promised. His Hitler was, especially at first, very popular in Germany. He spent money building roads and other public works. The famous Autobahn dates to Hitler's time and power. Um, a, a system of roads that would later inspire the United States interstate system. Um, famous today because most parts have no speed limit. Even then, it was advertised to tourists. Here is a tourist brochure from the 1930s encouraging people from English-speaking countries to come and speed along the German Imperial Autobahn. Hitler believed every German person should be able to afford a car, and he proposed the idea of a people's car, which in German is pronounced Volkswagen. Um, there we have an early Volkswagen auto show. Um, a car that would be affordable 
for anyone. They would support a small family. Although Hitler wanted Germans to have large families, even awarding medals, the Mother's Cross, to every woman who had eight or more children. Um, a medal awarded once a year on Hitler's mother's birthday. But when unemployment fell almost to zero, from a height um, close to 50%. People had jobs, cars, and roads to enjoy them. Hitler even promised everyone in Germany an annual vacation. At least all Germans, because he also gradually began the process of discrimination against Jews and other groups. It would eventually end in the Holocaust. But at first, with the Nuremberg Laws, two years after coming to power, defining Jews um, by how many Jewish grandparents they had and stripping them of citizenship, declaring them to be subjects who had to follow the law but weren't necessarily protected by it. Their paperwork was marked with a J to show they were Jewish. Eventually, most were required to wear a yellow star saying Jew on them. To make it very clear, they even had to adopt the middle name Sarah or Isaac, so even their middle name would give away their race. After a couple years of that, um, when Germans accepted these discriminations, the Nazis launched Kristallnacht, or, or a Crystal Night, but often translated to as the Night of Broken Glass. When Nazis attacked Jewish homes and synagogues and businesses across Germany, then known as Crystal Night, because the broken glass in the streets the next day, some said, looked like crystals. Um, the Nazis wanted to see if the German people would accept this, and there was no protest against these acts of terrorist vandalism. And this would pave the way, eventually, for a final solution to the Jewish question, as Hitler put it, um, to round up the Jews and exterminate them. Um, many had for years been in concentration camps, which were at first just big prison camps, where a person might be arrested for many crimes, like being a communist, or being a homosexual, or being unemployed, all of which were illegal. Although a Jewish person was even more likely to be singled out than others. Eventually, though, um, they, were, they, especially those in places he conquered, might just be shot dead in the fields, and the concentration camps, too, evolved, especially newer ones built in conquered territories, into extermination camps, where Jews, but many other um, undesirable groups, and here we can see um, some people who are mentally retarded, we can see a Catholic monk, we can see uh, a Romanian girl, and others, also being targeted for being, in Hitler's view, um, undesirable or subhuman, a process that would eventually come to be known as the Holocaust. In addition to the extermination camps, the Nazis performed various medical experiments. Here we can see someone being frozen in a bath of ice water, which was an experiment desired by the military, so they would see how to revive somebody who went, who was half frozen, especially pilots or sailors who fell into the waters of the North Sea. They wanted to experiment with how to revive somebody who'd fallen into freezing water. Um, we can see people who had uh, poisonous chemicals or diseases injected into them to see how they respond. Um, and for the benefit of the military, there's a man in a chamber with all the oxygen being sucked out to depressurize it to see how pilots at very high altitudes um, would, could deal with low pressure. Um, and then people subject to other experiments. In total, it's believed about 11 million people were killed in the Holocaust about 6 million Jews, about 5 million others. And we have a pretty clear idea of this, because Germans were very orderly people and kept very meticulous records for this, even um, having IBM build special accounting machines to keep track of it. And Hitler also began to gradually rearm, to rebuild his military, again starting about two years in, in 1935, um, to enlarge his army, to rebuild an air force, to again begin building tanks. All of this was against the Treaty of Versailles, but the League of Nations um, did nothing, or um, almost nothing. They did complain and say Hitler should not do this. Hitler then um, called Germany out of the League of Nations. Italy left shortly afterwards when they were criticized um, for their invasion of East 
1936, the same year the Italians took over Ethiopia, Hitler and Mussolini signed an alliance. Mussolini said that in the future, the world would revolve around an axis running from Rome to Berlin. The world will revolve around them. A very totalitarian idea. And so their alliance would come to be known as the Axis from this speech. And from here, Hitler began to propose um, that um, since there were German-speaking peoples outside Germany, something ought to be done. Austria, in particular, being populated almost entirely by ethnic Germans, ought to join with Germany. And there was quite a bit of support for this in Austria, although definitely not universal support. Um, and so, in March of 1938, Hitler marched into Austria in a process known as the Anschluss, meaning unification. Here we see some German propaganda from the time a poster of Hitler saying, one people, one empire, one leader. This violated the Treaty of Versailles. Um, which had specifically said Germany and Austria could not unify, but the, the League of Nations and its most important members, Britain and France, did nothing. Besides, Hitler said this was all he wanted, although under his breath he was thinking for six months. Because six months later, he pointed out that in western Czechoslovakia, an area known as the Sudetenland, most people were German-speaking, ethnically German. And so perhaps they too, but just then, not the rest of Czechoslovakia, should be part of Germany. And so a meeting was held in the city of Munich to discuss the future of the Sudetenland. There we can see, of course, in the, in the center, Hitler looking quite pleased with himself, Mussolini on the one side, on the other side, um, Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of Britain, and Edward Gladier, the uh, Prime Minister of France. Um, but what country with an interest in Western Czechoslovakia does not seem to be represented? Czechoslovakia was not invited to the conference about their future. They had to wait in the hotel lobby. And when Chamberlain de Ladier walked out, they couldn't meet the Czech leader's gaze because they had agreed Hitler could have the Sudetenland. After all, it's full of Germans, and anyway, he promises that's all he wants. Chamberlain went home to cheering crowds. He said, we have brought peace in our time. But this would come to be known as appeasement, giving in to someone's demands to avoid a fight. Um, and so Hitler moved into the Sudetenland, which is all he wanted, at least for six months. In March of 1939, he moved into the rest of Czechoslovakia. The Sudetenland had not just held most of the Germans in Czechoslovakia, but also most of Czechoslovakia's border defenses, so that there was nothing Czechoslovakia could do. And so the only really democratic country in Central Europe was taken over by the Nazis, with no one to resist. And um, the next month, April 1939, just to have something to do, Italy took over the country of Albania, which they had kind of been pushing around for a couple decades anyway, but now took over outright, um, forcing the king of Albania, King Gog, into exile. He moved to New York, taking with him two suitcases full of gold. And so appeasement apparently was not working, and Britain and France now said they would not put up <coughs> with any more German aggression. But Hitler, understandably, didn't believe them. He began to mass troops along the Polish border. And even though Britain and France promised to protect Poland, Hitler wasn't worried about them, although he was worried about the Soviet Union. Because Hitler and Stalin hated each other ideologically. The Nazis were a strong right-wing ideology, a racist, nationalist, um, believing, though, in capitalism, although capitalism working closely with the government. The Soviet Union was extreme left-wing, not capitalist, but communist. Um, in principle, not racist, although Stalin sometimes was, and not nationalist. They were internationalist, believing everyone should be a communist and unite. 
or at least the workers should. Their system of identity was based not on race, but on class, the workers of the world against their oppressors. But if the Nazis and the Soviets had um, diametrically opposed ideas, they had exactly the same methods. And as totalitarian dictators, they understood one another. And on August 23, 1939, Hitler and Stalin um, agreed to what we usually call the Nazi-Soviet Pact, although officially the molotov von ribbentrop Pact, but that's harder to spell. In this agreement, the two agreed to share Poland and some other parts of Eastern Europe between them. Um, and with this agreement um, written down in secret, although not secret for that long, one week later, September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland. And now at last, two days later, September 3rd, Britain and France declared war, which we typically consider the beginning of the Second World War, although for the U.S. it wouldn't begin until two years later, and for China it had been going on for almost a decade. Um, this map shows the two sides of World War II, sort of. The black areas are all the Axis countries and the furthest they ever got in their conquests. The green countries, of course, are all the Allied countries and their various colonies around the world. Um, aside from the parts taken over by the Axis, although in fact the world would never have looked precisely like this, quite a few countries became allies pretty late once the Axis had already been pushed back from some of the black areas, but gives a pretty good sense of the two sides. As you can see, there were a few neutral countries here and there, uh, but very, very few. Um, now, in his invasion of Poland, Hitler used Blitzkrieg. German for lightning war. The German army, having this, had been learned from World War I, that allowing the enemy to set up defensive positions led to the stalemate of trench warfare. So they would move quickly, like lightning, um, a strategy of rapid movement. Dive bombers, fast-moving planes, would bomb enemy lines, break up their defense and their morale. Then tanks would move in quickly, to exploit weaknesses in the lines. Once they had broken up the enemy lines further, um, infantry, you know, foot soldiers, would move in not by foot, but by truck to get there even more quickly. Um, and paratroopers would be dropped behind enemy lines to further confuse and demoralize them. Um, an excellent tactic, um, it, as long as it could achieve victory within about six weeks. It is based on rapid movement and of course based on fuel for tanks, for planes, for trucks. And if it goes on too long, you can move beyond your supply lines. You eventually have to stop, regroup, and kind of digest what you have conquered. Again, a, uh, a great strategy if it can be done in about six weeks. Fortunately for Hitler, Poland fell in about three weeks. Hitler claiming the western half of Poland, as the Nazi-Soviet pact had agreed, um, and a few days later, after Hitler invaded, the Soviets invaded the eastern half, seizing what they had agreed to get, which Poland, by the way, has never gotten back. Today, what the Soviets got from Poland are parts of uh, um, Belarus and Ukraine today. Um, the bit they got from Romania is now the separate country of Moldova. Um, and in the places the Soviets took over, they massacred thousands of people they saw as class enemies, especially Polish army officers. But other members of the middle and upper classes were rounded up um, in what's remembered as the Katyn Massacre. Nearly 22,000 Polish people were massacred by the Soviets, um, not entirely at Katyn, but the first mass graves were discovered in the Katyn Forest a couple years later. One way they decide who to kill was by looking at the hands of prisoners. And if their hands were too smooth, they were clearly part of the upper class. A working class person would have rough hands with calluses. Someone without calluses was rich, an oppressor, and should be killed. And after the fall of Poland, <coughs> the rest of the world was next, at least for Hitler. 
although not yet. Hitler took some time to digest Poland, to prepare for future fighting, to see what Britain and France would do, which turned out to be very little. Some Polish refugees escaped to Britain, and among other things, played a big role in decoding the Nazi secret codes, um, and would later go on to fight in the wars with the British army. And Britain also sent troops to defend France, but otherwise, Britain and France did so little. They sometimes called it the phony war, and the Germans sometimes called it six creed, not lightning war, but sitting war. But by April of 1940, and after about six months, Hitler was ready to move again. On April 9, 1940, the Germans conquered Denmark, seizing that small country in about a day, although allowing Denmark some self-government even officially retaining their, their ruler, King Christian X, the idea being that Danish people were Aryans and worth treating as equals. Although many Danish people quietly resisted and were able to sneak many of their Jewish people out of the country. Um, on April 9th, the Germans also invaded Norway. And the Norwegians would hold out in some areas for some time, but most of Norway's major cities fell quickly in part because local Nazi sympathizers helped the Nazis sneak troops and tanks into the country um, in military transports disguised as cargo ships. Um, on May 10th, the Nazis invaded the Low Countries. Luxembourg fell in a day. The Netherlands, despite having been neutral in the First World War, were invaded nonetheless and fell in five days. Poor little Belgium actually held out for about three weeks before finally being forced to surrender, their king himself becoming a prisoner of war, although your king being under house arrest isn't that bad. And many Belgian people resented him for not escaping the country, as many other monarchs did, um, and serving as kind of a point of resistance elsewhere. Um, the French had been aware Germany might attack and had built massive fortifications called the Maginot Line along the border between Britain, or sorry, between France and Germany. Um, very involved fortifications. There were underground generators, underground barracks, subways to move troops around underground, gun turrets that could go underground or pop up to attack the enemy when he got close. A line of fortifications believed to be impenetrable. And so the Germans didn't try to penetrate it. They went around to the Ardennes Forest, a place the French believed was so thickly forested the Germans couldn't get through, but then they did. French forces were cut in half. French forces in the west and most British forces retreated to the town of Dunkirk, where, in what is remembered as the miracle of Dunkirk, not only did the British Navy come to try to rescue them, but every British person who owned a boat of any size that could reach Dunkirk sailed there as well the British people saving their army. Between the British and French troops who were evacuated, over 338,000 soldiers were saved. Um, all they had to leave their equipment behind. And June 14, 1940, the Germans captured Paris, about five weeks after first invading France. There we have Hitler being a good tourist and having his picture made in front of the Eiffel Tower. Um, a week later, June 22nd, the French surrendered entirely. Northern France was totally occupied. Southern France was officially left as an independent country known as Vichy France, after what became its capital, the city of Vichy. Um, but they're only independent as long as they did what Germany said. And for the most part, they did, although every now and then they did refuse. Among other things, they turned over their colonies in Africa to Germany um, and their colonies in Asia to Japan. Some French did resist. There was a French resistance movement. There we can see they vandalized a poster showing the president of BC France. Uh, some escaped to Britain or elsewhere and fought back. Um, one of their most famous leaders of the Free French was Charles de Gaulle a general of the French army. There were several other significant ones too, but de Gaulle was the best at promoting himself, and thus is the one best remembered. So by the summer of 1940, only Britain 
stood alone against the Germans, and having left behind much of their military equipment at Dunkirk, um, what really would hold off the Germans would be the British Royal Air Force. At this point, the British selected a new Prime Minister, forcing Neville Chamberlain out of office and replacing him with Winston Churchill, who was one of the few British leaders to have warned for years that the Nazis might turn out to be dangerous. Um, and the Nazis were dangerous, as in August and September, they began an air battle over Britain, with only the Royal Air Force to hold them off. Um, despite being outnumbered, in the Battle of Britain, um, the British Royal Air Force was able to hold off on the German Luftwaffe, or air weapon, as their air forces are called, and because the Germans could never completely destroy the British Air Force, Hitler was not willing to launch an invasion across the English Channel um, for fear the British Air Force would sink any ships that he saw. 